Good evening and thank you very much Nina for enabling this to happen and um, I hope you're all able to hear and see the event and I can see that um, people have been arriving from all over the world um, so I'm delighted to welcome you all. Um, we're expecting over 180 virtual attendees uh, which is very exciting and on behalf of the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research at Anglia Ruskin University where we are acknowledging World Alzheimer's Day today. Um, I warmly welcome you all. Um, we're going to be presenting and discussing our research for people living with dementia and their families. We welcome especially in this first teaching week of the semester to all our new students who've come to Anglia Ruskin University and all you students from all over the world. It's a very um, interesting time to be starting your studies and of course to everyone. Our research institute is expanding. Um, we're focusing on our healthy aging and dementia area tonight, but we also um, prioritize research in the areas of neuroscience and music therapy, neuro rehabilitation and stroke, mental health, children, young people and families. Um, and so I'm going to say a bit more about how this evening is going to go. Um, we're presenting three research projects this evening, including how we've adapted and changed approaches to cope with the pan current pandemic. And I'm lucky enough to be involved in different ways in all three of these very multidisciplinary projects, which focus upon new approaches within music therapy and music's role and its benefits for people living with dementia and their families. In setting up the round table, um, I posed some questions for the speakers from our teams, and these will be addressed through their short presentations. And then for a while, we will debate those um, questions between the panel members, um, which are chair and arbitrate, because there'll be lots of different views, I think. Um, and finally, during the last 20, 25 minutes of this hour and a half round table, Nina will collect themes from your audience questions and these will be further discussed. So we hope that we'll try and represent all your points of view um, through those. The questions that we're considering include, what's the research design and music therapy approach within each project and why? What are the expected outcomes and benefits expected for the people involved. For example, what's likely to be a unique benefit or contribution to new knowledge that will improve lives for people with dementia and their families in the future. Another question um, that's most important is how are participants' voices through PPI and participant, patient and public involvement um, shaping our research? How are their voices heard in the research? So Dr. Ming Hsu, um, you can see our names, I think, is the clinical trials manager here for Homeside. You'll hear about these projects. I'm just naming them at the moment. And he's um, also head of MHA Care Homes Music Therapy Service. He'll give a global overview of music therapy research right now to begin with and what's needed in the future. And then Together in Sound is presented by senior lecturer here, Claire Molyneux and Homeside by Jody Bloska, Clinical Research Fellow, and Radio Me by Dr. Alex Street, Senior Research Fellow here. So um, we, we work together, although we've been working virtually, um, you know, discussing and, and, and exchanging about our projects. But to start our round table, here is Bob Stewart, one of the participants from Together in Sound, talking about music and its role for his wife, who lived with dementia in his role as a PPI group member for Homeside. It is an excerpt from the recruitment video made by our Homeside participant and public involvement group. You can find it on our website. So this is just a short excerpt to um, take us into this subject. And following that, the round table presentations will begin.
that music was totally different. Her memory was remarkable musically, both in terms of the tune and indeed the words. She very seldom required words given to her. She would just hear a tune and automatically know it and know the words. To a degree that quite amazed me because, and indeed it gave me huge solace, for no other reason than there was part of her memory that was functioning. I know it's a, norm, a different part of the brain to the norm, but that didn't matter. It was simply the effect that it had on Anne, uh, and as well as me. Thank you, Bob, um, and who often joins us actually, so um, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm just gonna hand over now to Ming. Welcome. Hello. Uh, share my uh, screen. Uh, bear with me. Okay. So I'm hoping to uh, provide a brief overview about music therapy and dementia research, and uh, hopefully it will provide some um, kind of insight into the research uh, we are doing at Simta but also um, some research that we might be able to develop in the future. So, um, okay. So dementia is obviously a priority according to uh, the health, uh, World Health Organization. And every three seconds, we would be seeing a person um, diagnosed with dementia. And with this increasing number of uh, people being diagnosed with dementia, there will be an increasing cost um, to be able to provide uh, the support and treatment required. So it would be the same in the UK and, um, and the cost would be projected to 50 billion, 55 billion in 2040. And Although um, a lot of time we will hear about um, you know, care home fees and uh, in the news about the government not having enough funding to support a continuing health care, but actually from research we understand that um, most of the cost is actually shouldered by family caregivers and, um, and we know the fact that it's not just because of the um, unpaid hours our care for giving, uh, that's kind of contributing to the cost, but also, um, but also uh, the, the demand um, for, of caring for someone with dementia emotionally and physically. And that's why support is really needed uh, for family caregivers. And um, from research, we we'll also understand that managing symptoms uh, such as agitation, depression, apathy, etc., is a key task. And um, a recent study by UCL suggests that the, um, to manage clinically uh, significant uh, symptoms of uh, agitation will cost around one thousand one hundred twenty-five pounds per year. And this accounts for 44% of the health and social care costs of dementia in care homes. And we know the fact that from the recent reports that um, during the pandemic, and this population is very much um, uh, impacted uh, with uh, reduced access to health and community services and the, the support for people with dementia and their caregiver is urgent. So I just want to uh, take people to, uh, to look at what types of research we can do to help address dementia. And I just want to uh, restrict it to uh, the research relevant to music therapy. And so we know that from systematic reviews, which are 
regard it as the, as the strongest uh, evidence in um, medicine and healthcare. We know that music therapy has had some effects. So these are the effects, so anxiety, depression, agitation, cognition and quality of life. Obviously, we need more research. However, I think uh, the systematic reviews, the nature is that it can tell us the, the knowledge gap, where the knowledge gap is. And so at the moment, we know that um, sleep disturbance is uh, frequently uh, reported by caregivers. However, we don't know whether music therapy or music can have an effect on that. And uh, to support people to stay in their own homes as long as it's feasible, we do need to support people. But, um, but we don't know whether music therapy can promote independence or support independence. We don't know the effect. So really the system, systematic reviews will give us um, some indications for future research. Another type of research is intervention. And as music therapists, we obviously aspire, aspire, aspire to uh, demonstrate that music therapy is helpful uh, in dementia care. But um, obviously, um, we need to develop more interventions. And we have, as SIMTA, we have spent a lot of uh, our time and energy in developing these interventions and also designing uh, clinical trial studies. And uh, recently, more and more attention is uh, paid to new technology. So technology that can help us, uh, so it help people with dementia uh, carry out uh, their day-to-day -day, um, activities to send reminders and to um, help them communicate with their caregivers and to, um, to also help people uh, navigate um, in the house or out outdoors. These, technologies can actually have some uh, potential um, uh, positive uh, impact um, on, on dementia care. So um, we, we need to think about probably music therapy interventions, how we can incorporate uh, these, te uh, these technologies. But at the same time, obviously, we want to show that music therapy can uh, reduce the needs for hospital or care home admissions and to be able to demonstrate that it's cost effective. And observational studies are important as well because we, if we want to develop better uh, or effective interventions, we will need to know what uh, factors can contribute to difficulties and challenges. And um, so we know that at the moment from the research, we know that caregiver burden is a predictor of institutional care. So we will need to develop music therapy interventions to help reduce uh, caregiver burden. However, we do need more observational studies to understand the factors that contribute to caregivers, caregiver burden. And there's a recent research like this one, um, Fancourt and uh, Stepto. So uh, from this observation study, it showed that uh, people who, who went, who, who visit uh, museums or who go to opera or concerts more frequently, they seem to have a lesser decline in cognition. And so maybe we need to think about, um, you know, um, if, we are developing an intervention, we might need to incorporate this aspect into our inter uh, intervention. So um, apart from observational study, we also want to look at validation studies. So in dementia care and in music therapy particularly, it's, it's very much about uh, developing tools that can help us understand per people's needs. And we know MMSC or MOCA, for example, these uh, assessment tools, they require a person with dementia to answer verbally, answer the questions um, verbally or draw something uh, physically on a piece of paper. And think about people with advanced dementia, they might not have maintained, um, retain the ability to do these. So can we use music? Music is a non-verbal means of communication. Can we utilize music to help assess cognition needs and other aspects? 
costs. And finally, uh, finally, I just want to talk about a mechanism study. Obviously, people are more and more interested in, in neuroscience studies. And um, the neuroscience studies of music really help us understand how these build, building blocks can actually influence behavior, cognition, and motion. And a recent study shows that rhythms, if um, when visual uh, targets are presented with uh, rhythmic uh, regular regularities, and actually these visual targets can be memorized or uh, recognized more effectively. So uh, these are what we see as the potential, as the potential for developing music therapy research or music research. But really how music therapy can support dementia care pathway is important. So this is a very much simplified uh, simplified uh, kind of dementia pathway. So we look at prevention, that's before the diagnosis. And the recent uh, Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention, Intervention and Care, they have suggested 12 factors that can contribute to dementia. And obviously, music therapy might not um, help with all of the factors, but we know physical inactivity, social isolation, depression was pretty much in you know, our music therapist's mind. And by the same time, um, hypertension, obesity, di diabetes, and other factors, we might not have a direct impact, but music therapy might help people lead, to lead a healthier lifestyle. Um, so that might have an indirect impact as well. And thinking about prevention, prevention is very much in the UK in the core of our social prescribing. So not everyone can benefit from a medical model of care. So um, before people, we want to um, prevent people from hitting the crisis, crisis point. So how do we prevent that? Obviously, music, choir singing and different things can help. And uh, as researchers, we might want to collaborate with uh, charities who have got some really good interventions in place already to enhance these interventions or further develop these interventions. And post-diagnostic support is also important. So in this stage, it's very much about helping people to stay in their own homes as long as it's feasible. So our radio me study um, developed at Simter with other universities and it's looking very much about promoting independence and supporting carers, a home size study and together in sound will be later on um, discussed more in depth by Claire and, um, and Jody and Alex will talk about the radio me project. And institutional care, we know when people move into care home, managing the symptoms is always a task, but we can probably presume that uh, the quality of life uh, with better symptom management is influenced by quality of care, but obviously more research is needed. But in our previous study, we have noticed what, what we have found that um, there's a potential for music therapy to influence uh, the care practice to be able to better manage the symptoms. So that's basically most of what I want to say, but before I finish, I just want to say one thing that I haven't kind of discussed. What is music therapy? At the moment, there's still a lack of, a, um, lack of understanding of music therapy kind of in, in the public in the UK. But um, so just to clarify that music therapy is a form of psychological treatment deliver, delivered by a qualified music therapist. So in the UK, music therapists are registered with the Health and Care Professions Council after their qualified, their qualifying uh, two years qualifying course. And music therapy sessions will involve verbal, nonverbal, and musical interactions. And we know that for people with dementia, words are obviously not probably not something we can always use to express. And so the interactions using within music, like using and playing instruments or singing would be really helpful. And music therapist practice in the UK is very much guided by the recommendations by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Most importantly though, sometimes when we look at uh, a session, either it's a music therapy session, 
or a, a music interactive uh, music making session, we can't really tell the difference. Well, the difference is probably here. For music therapists, the session is very much about uh, finding out clues and information about a person's needs. And if we can understand a person's needs, we will be able to um, advise the person and also their carers to find ways to better manage the symptoms and improve quality of life. So this is very much, very much my part. And um, yeah, so uh, other researchers will continue to talk about their respective projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ming. Um, and uh, we'll have some virtual way of um, thanking you very much. And we're gonna move on now to Claire Molyneux, uh, who's going to upload her presentation. Um, I've noticed that uh, there's a couple of questions in the question and answer section, so um, maybe some of them will be answered as we go along, but um, they'll be collected and we'll be um, asking um, some of the questions at the end. So, Claire, are you ready? I am ready. Um, Thank you, Helen. Welcome um, to you. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, some of you... I know from seeing your names in um, the chat will be familiar with Together in Sound and for some of you it, it might be a new project. Um, so I'm just going to talk um, a little bit about it. So Together in Sound was established in 2017 and it's a partnership project um, between the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research and Saffron Hall Trust. Um, Sorry, I think I might just have to come out of this slide share because my slides are not moving. Just bear with me one moment. Okay, I'm gonna try it this way. Okay, so while- That's better. Okay. Um, so, um, Together in Sound is a project that delivers music therapy groups to people living with dementia and their companions. Sessions are usually delivered in 10 week blocks and our groups usually range from 10 to 18 people. Um, and we have people coming both in um, pairs, so the person with dementia and their companion. And also we have now um, single participants joining us who previously came accompanying a person with dementia um, and now for a number of different reasons um, come, come on their own. Um, and each 10 week block usually has a sharing event, which is an opportunity for participants to share something of their experience with friends, family and stakeholders from the community. And this sharing event has a very important bridging function um, to the wider community. Saffron Hall makes recommendations for performers um, and um, musicians to join the sharing event and usually one of the sessions in the 10 weeks. And we've welcomed um, a, a range of musicians. Most recently, we've had three young musicians join us from the London Philharmonic Orchestra's Future First scheme. So as the project has developed, um, these underpinning values of partnership, participation and collaboration have emerged and are central to the things that we do in the project. So my PhD research is embedded in the project and the main research aim is to uncover the impact of music therapy groups in a community setting for people living with dementia and their carers. Um, so my research questions are looking at the impact that group music therapy has on participants and on the relationship between the individual and their companion. Um, and I'm also interested in how people who attend the group music therapy give an account of their experience. And finally, I'm interested in the nature of the particular music experience, music therapy experiences in the group that are impactful to keep a little bit to time as well thank you um, so in order to answer the research questions um, I've collected clinical data over 18 months um, with um, three 10 week blocks of music therapy groups in 2018 and 2019 um, I've completed some in-depth interviews using video and photo elicitation methods with couples who have attended the music therapy groups 
we've held three focus groups. Um, and I'm also um, using artifacts that have been created in sessions. We're in the final stages of making a film, um, which also included a process where participants were involved in helping us determine the direction and focus of the film, both before the filming started and um, in the final editing process of the film. So that's been quite an exciting project to work on as well. Um, and just to acknowledge that as this is a narrative inquiry in which I'm part of the therapeutic process and obviously have a dual role as researcher and therapist, um, keeping a reflective journal, research supervision, clinical supervision and regular conversations with a critical friend are all really important in helping um, the findings to be robust and trustworthy. Um, we have also got two forthcoming articles um, which have been co-authored, um, one which we also had a participant um, contribute and, and co-author the article, which is also a very exciting aspect of the project. Um, and so just moving on, I've got one final thing I want to share with you all. Oh, Nina, we can skip through this slide. I'd like to move on to the clip, please. Thank you. Um, so this song, um, outlines the essence of the project, really. Um, so at the beginning of this year, one of the groups told me that they would like to write a song about Together in Sound and what it meant to them. And so the song was created collaboratively over a number of sessions. Um, and we finished it off um, actually at the point where the sessions moved into, um, moved online at the point of the lockdown in this country. Um, and We'd like to play a video of part of the song with you and um, this filming was done, this was the last face-to-face -face session we had before the lockdown um, and we're joined by musicians from the London Philharmonic Orchestra and the filmmaker obviously. Um, and the lyrics of the song um, really do encapsulate the project from the participants perspective and they talked about the idea of feeling a sense of transformation so when they come into um, the building, they come in a rush, we come in a moil, come in a muddle and a bit of a fuddle, come with our worries, come with our cares, come with some anger and sometimes fear. And then the, the song talks about the impact of music and the music therapy groups for them um, and how the song tells a story. And for some participants, memory fades, but feeling remains. So I'm just going to end by sharing the video clip. Um, thank you, Nina. If you could play the clip that's at the bottom of the slide. Lovely. Our song, it tells a story, a story of coping, a story of love. There's a kindness around the room, a kindness we gave and received. Give and receive. Yeah. I set the scene. Very much um, Claire and all the participants and um, the teams at um, our Institute and also at Saffron Hall Trust um, in this partnership.
So I'm going to hand over now to Jodie. Um, Jodie Blosker, welcome. Uh, who's going to present the Homeside project, which um, some of us, Ming and I, are also involved in. Um, over to you, Jodie. All right. Um, hello, everybody. So I'm Jodie, and I'm a research fellow, as Helen said, um, at the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research. And I'm working on the Homeside study. So this study is an international research project, which is being carried out across five countries. So it's led by Professor Felicity Baker at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Um, and it also has research teams in the UK where the study is being led um, by Professor Helen O'Dell Miller at Anglia Ruskin University. And we also have teams in Norway, Germany, and Poland. Um, so the study is exploring these home-based music and reading um, interventions for people with dementia and their informal or family caregivers. And the study was planned to be delivered face-to-face -face with our participants. However, we have moved everything online due to COVID-19. So everything that takes place in the study, which I'll be telling you about, does take place virtually using telehealth software. All right, so as Ming mentioned earlier, there's a large number of informal or family caregivers of people with dementia. And although this can be a really rewarding and satisfying role and often a role that people want to do, it can be really challenging as well and have a huge impact on people's well-being. So Homeside aims to work with caregivers to give them ways of using various activities at home with the person they care for to help with day-to-day -day life. So that might be helping with low mood, that might be helping with getting someone moving and doing physical activity, and it might be finding activities that people can do together that when ways of being together um, are more difficult or they've changed now, so giving ideas of how they can be together. Um, so as I've mentioned, our participants in the study are people with dementia and their informal caregivers, and we are recruiting 495 um, dyad participants across the study, so that's 99 in the UK here. Um, and when we say informal caregivers, we mean anyone who's a family member of the person or a friend or an adult child, essentially anyone who's not a paid caregiver. And these people are living at home in the community. So within the study, there's three groups that the participants may be allocated to. So there's the music intervention, the reading intervention, or standard care. And so standard care is just continuing usual day-to-day -day activities without an intervention. Um, but I will say that those that are randomized to this group are offered at the end of their study period to choose either the music or reading intervention to take part in. And it is designed as a randomized control trial, so that means that the participants are randomly allocated to one of these three groups. And this is to help reduce bias in the study. So essentially, if, if we didn't have this random allocation, you might end up with like all the music, all the people who really love music and the music intervention, all the people who really love reading in the reading intervention, and that doesn't really give us a good idea of how it might work for the wider public. So the intervention is designed as indirect therapy. So this means that the qualified therapist works with the participants in order to enable them to mu use music or reading at home without the therapist. So in the music intervention, this is delivered by music therapists, and in the reading intervention is another qualified health professional, so for an occupational therapist or equivalent. So the intervention period lasts for 12 weeks and throughout the first six weeks, there's these three two hour training sessions. And also we have fortnightly phone calls with them as well. So these sessions are to, and phone calls are to support the participants to use these activities at home. And we aim for them to use them five times per week for 30 minutes each time. So data is collected at three points. So we have the baseline measures before they start the intervention, we have them at 12 weeks, so right after they finish. And then we also have a follow-up at three months after that, so six months since they start the trial. And effect effectively, this lets us see any change from before they start the intervention to when they finish, and then if there's any lasting effect after three months without any therapist input. So I won't go into too much detail about these outcome measures that we're using, um, but just to say that during the data collection, the participants are answering these standardized and validated questionnaires. Um, and this can indicate to us whether the intervention is effective. And our primary aim is to look at 
behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So do the interventions have any impact on those? Are they, do they decrease some of the symptoms that people are experiencing? So these might be things such as depression, anxiety, um, apathy, et cetera, as Ming um, spoke about earlier. Um, but we also are looking at the impact on quality of life for both participants, as well as the quality of the relationship, and as well as impact on caregivers' depression, resilience, and as well as their sense of competence or satisfaction in their caregiving role. And we're also will be looking at the cost effectiveness of the interventions as well. And then just to say that in addition to these sort of more quantitative outcomes, which are helpful to show the effectiveness, um, based on these standardized questionnaires. We are also collecting qualitative outcomes. So as we know, sometimes these standardized methods don't always um, give the whole story. They miss important information about the participants' experience. So we are carrying out interviews with the participants as well as having them fill in diaries where they can record how they use the activities. So this gives us a better idea of what worked for them and how it worked for them. And these are just a couple of quotes from participants about what benefits they've seen from the intervention um, when they had the, their interviews, this is what they said. All right, so finally, um, I'll just end with this. As Helen said, um, another really important part of the study for us has been the involvement from people who have been affected by the dementia themselves. So we have um, a patient or a participant in public involvement group um, who advises the study um, and they make sure what we are doing is relevant and helpful to them and I will let them explain this themselves and this is another just a little clip from the video they put together um, with us. I am part of the participant and public involvement group. This group seeks perspectives from people with dementia and informal caregivers to ensure the project is meaningful and useful for people with dementia and their informal caregivers. It's lovely because we in fact are a group who vet what is going on. We comment on the meetings of the, the experts. We can say to them from our experience, sorry, you've got it wrong. And or we can say, hadn't thought of that, please progress that, that is wonderful. So yeah, just overall, just to say that this group has been really important for us as we've designed the study and implemented it as well. It's been really important. Um, and I'm just gonna finish there um, and then stop sharing. And hand over to you. Thank you very much, Jodie. No thank you, there's so much to discuss, but we're going to move swiftly on um, to Dr. Alex Street. Welcome. Um, and he's going to talk about another project that's quite different, um, I think. Yes. Uh, uh, hello, good evening, everyone. It's great to hear about all this research. And um, there's quite a range, isn't there, um, with a lot of group. Um, activity and some home-based, which there hasn't been a lot done before. So I'll just go through Radio Me. Uh, so I'm putting share the old screen, and um, there we are. Hopefully you can all see that. So that is not that slide. There we go. Radio Me. So this is a collaboration between the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research here at Anglia Ruskin. Well, I say here, I'm, I'm not there. Um, University of Plymouth, Glasgow University, and also um, Brighton and, and Sussex, um, Nicholas Farina has, has been doing a huge amount um, uh, to get us through the regional ethics, which we now have approval to carry on. And it's funded by the um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. So it's a design and testing project. Hi, you Alex. Uh, yeah. Do you think we can see your slides? Because um, we can't see them. Oh, no, hang on, I forgot to push the actual share button. Okay, there. great. Oh, how's your... Are we there? Yes. You're great. Right. Okay, thank there you everyone for being patient with us all. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Okay. Um, so yes, it's a design and testing project using artificial intelligence to adapt and personalize live radio, so the radio program of the person's choice, 
uh, for people living with dementia who are still living independently. And this ultimately is to ensure that they can remain in their home using this technology with the best quality, qual quality uh, of life as possible, for as long as possible. So it plays real live radio broadcast and it mixes diary announcements into the radio program which will be smoothly interjected at the appropriate time and plays calming, relaxing music um, which will be selected prior to testing by uh, each participant. Um, so when they feel agitated this music is played uh, and the agitation is detected by a wearable and it's based on heart rate variability which will be calibrated to each person. So some research has shown that you can map uh, music onto an arousal valence. So if you imagine arousal as a sort of dimmer switch of consciousness uh, and as it gets high you become more aware and, 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 and more uh, able to attend to things. Uh, and so for example if you look in the relaxed, and I know it's a bit grainy because it's grainy on mine as well, um, but um, it would be quiet, slow, smooth music, smooth transitions, a um, few instruments, uh, perhaps acoustic guitar, woodwinds, that sort of thing. So that research is going to really help um, with identifying the, the right kind of music, because if we don't get that right, we're not doing the right thing. Um, so the wearable, you just see on this diagram the person is wearing it, um, it's calibrated to them, so the threshold that indicates the onset of agitation as, as soon as possible um, will then go to the system and generate the, the music that they've selected previously, which is calming music, that is their preferred music. Um, and then we can see what happens with the heart rate variability levels. So it smoothly interjects the live radio stream. So there are three stages to the design. The co-design stage with um, 20 participants. Um, and that's where we do things like identify, we, we work with people with dementia and carers and people who are interested, we, we work with our um, advisory group and it's a four year project as well. Um, uh, to identify the sort of voice that they would like to hear, you know, make, uh, giving them their diary reminders each day, reminding them that they need to have a drink, have something to eat, perhaps someone's coming around to see them. Um, and we work with them to find the best way to identify the 20 pieces of relaxing music, preferred relaxing music, and then we test it by playing it live with those people. That's what the, the Wizard of Oz um, refers to, is that we're, we're actually playing the music live to them while they're wearing the, the bio bracelet um, and seeing what happens with heart rate variability as we manipulate the music. And what sort of diary system interface um, would be useful? So. Um, at the moment, all of this will be housed inside a laptop, um, and so we want to know what does the screen need to look like, that sort of thing. Stage two um, is, um, is where we really um, calibrate the um, wearables so that they are, uh, we know that they're responding to the uh, music that's being played correctly. Uh, and then there's the testing stage with a further 20 participants where we leave it in their home um, for three months and then we collect uh, data, questionnaire data, um, and then we leave it further three months. And so working with, with people with dementia, well, you know, this is the whole point really. Um, th there's so much music available and there's a growing body of evidence to show that um, just listening to music, so this is just playing music, um, can, can have this um, benefit of you know, manipulating arousal levels. If people want to become more energetic, they can play that music that does that. But the question is how? How do you do it? And how do you play the music when it's most needed? So we have to work out the best way to identify those 20 pieces of music. And then test it, so go into people's homes, or if whatever we can do 
online um, if we can play different versions and we're collecting that heart rate variability data to see um, how it, it might vary if it's a simpler arrangement if we reduce the tempo that kind of thing does that reduce the heart rate um, and of course the wearable has to be transmitting the data correctly so that people and, and, and the system has to be easy to operate so we've got to work out where in the home is the best place for it um, what the control panel, the interface looks like so that it's easy to operate, so the person can ident identify it clearly as the system that's playing the music, um, and that it can be heard um, throughout the home or where, where necessary in the home. Um, and we'll also be using a, an observer system as well. Um, or, again, how we do this remotely, I'm not really sure, but that's a system of cameras uh, with some software that can identify through facial expressions, for example, um, what uh, the emotion the person is experiencing. So that together with, you know, the, the, the music therapist who's going to be doing all of this, um, with their observations and the observer system, we can really, uh, we've got the best possible chance of identifying the right music. Um, so we don't want people to be upset, we don't want people to be, you know, become over aroused um, and perhaps more agitated. Um, we want it to do to do the right thing. So that's that's Radio Me. Oh. Okay, thanks very much, Alex, and thanks to everyone for bearing with us um, with uh, some of the technical issues. Um, We've been working remotely, although some teaching is happening on site. Some of us have seen each other this, this week or last week, the first time. But um, I was just thinking, actually listening, um, of how, um, in a way, that's mirrored by thinking about the face-to-face -face interactive nature of music therapy um, that we've just heard about, um, where the music... Alex just said something about, well, let's hope that um, the music has an effect that's needed by the participant, um, or it's not too upsetting or distressing. You know, if you're using another approach, which we're also investigating, or were at the beginning of Homicide, you know, you are able to be live and interactive with participants, which um, in Claire's project, you've seen that happen as well through the through the songwriting but in improvisation which um, has been more difficult during lockdown you can adapt as a music therapist in the moment to the needs you can personalize something um, but radio me is actually looking at doing that through recorded music so that's just to open up first of all to the panelists um, You've heard each other's presentations a bit before, but just listening there, that's, there are themes, particularly about the different ways that music can be used and particularly pertinent perhaps in thinking about what's needed for the future. Um, so I think I'll just leave it, kick off there maybe with the different ways that music is used and then perhaps we'll move on to the research design and, and the participant involvement. So if anyone wants to start just responding um, to that theme, we'll discuss a bit between ourselves and then we'll open up and look at your questions. So do keep asking them in the Q&A. Um, we've got seven actually, so that's brilliant. But there's a, over a hundred people here, so um, do ask, do comment. So I don't know who'd like to kick off on that one. Um, thinking about music and live and recorded music and, and the differences. Claire, okay. Um, well, well, I was just thinking about that and I was also just sort of scrolling through the questions and I was thinking about um, some of the responses from the participants and the carers in Together in Sound has been that their experience of coming to um, group music therapy has really inspired them, I think some, somebody talks about the fact that he, he thinks differently about music now. He thinks differently about the way that he uses music in, um, to support daily routine for, for, his, for his wife who has dementia um, and that music plays a different role. So it's quite interesting that that was, um, that the live group music therapy was a stimulus for then 
considering the role of music in other aspects of, of life. Uh -huh. So both to support activities of daily living, um, to support mood in the ways that Alex um, has described um, Radio Me is hoping to do. Um, I'm sure there was a third one, but um, yeah, I, I, I think I think that was just a, just yeah. was was where my thoughts were really in relation yeah. to that. Thank you, Jodie. Were you um, going to respond? Because of course, Homeside is looking at the embedding of yeah, so it's music quite... making in the in, in daily life. Yeah, so as Clara said, with Together in Sound, it seems to be something that naturally came out of um, going to those sessions that the, the, couple, the couples would, you know, take the music away from the sessions and use that at home. Whereas I suppose in home side, it's much more targeted, like that's what we're trying to have them do. Um, and I suppose in some ways, I suppose because we're giving them that extra support to do that, um, then it's helpful, but maybe it's more helpful for them to naturally want to do that themselves as well. Um, and I was just thinking about you know, something that one of the participants said um, in the home side study was that the, the care recipients, the person with dementia is in the more advanced stages. And she was saying that it would have been really helpful to have something like home side earlier. But then also one of the things she was saying was that it's helpful having it now because they can't go out to group sessions. It's something that they can still do at home and they find um, doing online groups and things like that quite difficult because of the stage of her dementia as well. So I suppose there's um, room for both sort of across the different stages of dementia as well, um, which is quite interesting, I suppose. Yeah, thank you. I suppose Ming, I don't know if you wanted to come in because um, in some care home settings, music therapists have actually continued um, working face to face and uh, and you've also got research happening um, within MHA that uh, might be interesting as part of this discussion. Or Alex, you know, just chip in. Did you, did you yeah, um, I yeah, so um, during, throughout the kind of the period of lockdown, um, like the music therapists who work for MHA that have been um, very much on the forefront, the front line. And um, although we have to, we ha had to um, kind of um, use the modified approach. So the music therapists, they don't travel to different homes to reduce the risk of um, cross contamination. And, but, um, we have been able to um, deliver one-to-one -one music therapy sessions and group therapy sessions, although, you know, like PPE has to be, um, you know, in place at all times. But um, I think, yeah, so we still want to maintain our therapeutic uh, inputs um, as part of the day-to-day -day care. But there's also, there have also been some challenges as well, like, you know, some music therapists have reported that with them, you know, the face masks on and um, they, they found it quite difficult to engage um, care home residents in one to one sessions and in group sessions because they would not be able to see their facial expressions. And it's, it's been quite challenging. And so this is obviously an area we would need to uh, look at and maybe research is the, you know, is the answer. And um, um, we have been delivering some remote one-to-one uh, -one and group sessions as well. And uh, the, uh, I think these sessions will require the, some support and help from care, care, the care staff because obviously care home residents, if they have dementia, they will not be able to pay attention, always engage well, you know, with the, um, the screen. So um, the staff will need to help to kind of direct and help them deploy their attention and without the support um, it's, it, it can be quite hard. So again it might suggest that better technology like a virtual reality maybe that can really engage someone's attention that can help. That might be one too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was just mindful of the fact that um, one of the things that happened which I suppose was reflected in the song of together in sound and that you're capturing in your your project Claire and in the research is um, the 
connection that people can have through music, but also during lockdown, that they could still feel connected um, in their individual homes um, through the technology that we do have. Um, we've been, you know, I didn't know if you wanted to comment a bit about that. Well, it, it's quite interesting, um, actually, Helen, because we we had we continued delivering sessions online um, throughout March through to uh, July, and then we had a, a little break of a, of a few weeks, um, during which time we shared, um, uh, we had some videos made by some of our visiting artists, which were shared with our participants. So there was still that connection. Um, and interestingly, we had a welcome back session on Friday. And um, in, in that session, so this was the first time we'd seen each other in, I think about four or five weeks, um, we wrote a song together and the, I haven't got the words in front of me, but um, the, some of the phrases that people came out with was um, the laughter's back, the fun is back, the connection, um, even the word normality, that just for them coming back to this idea that they could have a weekly, even though it was online and it was so different, that was a normality in the context of these very different times in which we're living. Um, and um, yeah, it, it was, it was very striking actually to to see that um, sense of connection that that people really felt to each other, and I also yeah. think to um, to the sense of community that's been created with that project. There's a real yeah. sense of belonging that people seem to um, seem to experience to it. Yes, thank you, Alex. Did you want to come in? Uh, well, I was thinking about one of the questions. Uh, I think one or two people have put into the chat, they've asked, you know, what, what sort of interventions are used. And I think that the important thing really is to, is to identify, you know, the level of interaction that's, that's required, you know, whether it's going, you're working with somebody who perhaps is, is less able to orientate themselves, a bit more confused, it's, it's, you know, and I'm sure Ming would be the person to, and, and Helen to sort of, elaborate on this but you know that 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 then requires a bit more of a sort of face to face you know perhaps tactile interaction you know sharing an instrument playing the music together that kind of thing whereas what we're talking about with radio me is somebody um who is still living independently perhaps with a few hours um of um input you know from carers or something i mean i know some a brilliant engineer who we've all met from um, from Cambridge University, who who set who set it up himself for his his mum, uh, and he he controls the the radio that she listens to, and puts on music that he knows will get her to wake up, and get out of bed, so she's up in time for the carers. It's 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 all it's all doable, you know. I think um, the other thing about music intervention, as far as I'm I'm concerned, is well, you know, if it can be delivered by anybody then we must make that happen <laughs> so that as many people as possible can knows how to use music you know there's this question about um can you prescribe music for something can you prescribe music to help someone um feel uh, more aware of their environment uh, you know to feel happier even you know and we all know that it can work but you know certainly my experience is a bit hit and miss really i mean i can't even do that for myself so if we can better the tools, and I know that there are these streaming services, you know, Amazon and and um, a play, playlist for life, which you can link to your um, uh, other account. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, and you can identify music by that sort of window of where it's been found that you know, music has the most meaning. But but even then, you've got to be careful. And someone else put a question in the chat. You know, what if someone gets upset? Which I did address when I was when I was talking about radio me and you know they're, they're really important questions yeah that's right and um, those are some of the things that I think are on our minds all the time trying to really find this out and I know Jodie you want to come in I just wanted to comment thank you all um, to say that some of you mentioned but um, for all our projects that we're running um, any examples and any participant um, video or comments or anything we've got um, permission they've given consent and ethical permission for us to um, talk about the work or they've made videos themselves in order to 
um, give that message and that that's really important and it's key to um, the beginning of any project, the ethical um, agreement and to thank actually all the participants, some of whom will be sharing with us um, for sharing their stories um, because it does help further research. And we've had a big take up um, for Homeside across the five countries. We need to engage uh, 495 couples, which is about 99 in each country. And uh, we've engaged 30 so far and we, we've found that people are actually really willing and really keen to get involved. Um, so Jody, I know you wanted to comment and then we'll come back. Yeah, I was going to just pick up from what Alex was saying about um, sort of prescriptive music, I suppose, in a sense that, yeah, it would be nice if we could have, you know, I think this is what you're getting at, Alex, that like, it's not, you can't really be that prescriptive about it. It'd be nice if we could just have 20 songs that made everyone happy, but um, it's not really how it works with music, is it? And you get a lot of questions when we're recruiting and things for Homeside, like, okay, so is it going to be music that um, you're going to pick for them and is it do you have a playlist already that you're going to use and that that's what you're trying to find out if that works or not um, but actually it's very much um, for based on their personal preferences so we have a whole assessment process where we um, kind of go through their musical history and their past and same with reading as well kind of finding out those things that are relevant to them and implementing that and helping them find those songs that maybe they've forgotten about or that they wouldn't think about um, using in their daily life um, so just think, I think there was a question as well about that, if, like things like, oh, is there going to be 20 songs that are, we're going to use? Um, so I think, yeah, I think with all of these interventions as well, it's, going, it's quite informed by the, the music therapist and the, you know, the person themselves and the caregiver and finding these different songs and the music that they're using. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, if, if anybody's ever spent any time trying to assemble their own playlist of of 20 songs that they, they that are their real favourites that they would um, you know like to listen to I don't know every day for a week or something like that I mean who's ever done that you know um, I mean there was a time when when people um, made playlists you know on on cassette for people <laughs> and sent them to them to listen to um, and you know those decisions about the songs on the playlist were determined by perhaps shared memories you know and experiences um, uh, so, it, it's, I mean, I think um, the, the technology is emerging that, that uh, if it, as long as it's um, connected to a wearable, um, and I mean, some of the research looking at heart rate variability and EEG um, and skin conductivity as well um, has, has, you know, again shown that um, music can be mapped onto this arousal valence. Um, and music can be played at, uh, to, to match the existing heart rate and the existing arousal level and then be adjusted to either increase that or decrease it. Yeah. So it's definitely moving in that direction. Um, but what the live music therapy does, of course, is um, allows the music therapist to respond to everything that's going on in the moment, doesn't it? You know, it's, it, and people are asking, you know, what kind of interventions? Well, you could be improvising with somebody. You can be improvising together, playing the keyboard and the other person playing the drum or a, a xylophone in, in, in the same tonality that you're playing. Um, and you change speed together, you change intensity, loudness together, you know, you change perhaps the rhythmicity um, together, you start and stop together, you know, and that, that's that sort of non-verbal interaction. But, you know, how can you, how can you do that remotely? You know, where, where's the technology to do that, where there's no lagging and there's no you know, yeah. drop out, you know. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, I mean, the other thing is about context. So I think we'll move to the questions in a minute, but I just wanted to say the other things about context. So a piece of music on one day um, may um, give you a particular association or memory that um, is a longing or sadness or remind you of relationship or, or, or something in the past and on another day actually it might be the same piece of music might be something that would lift your mood and you might feel exuberant about um, and that's very interesting if we did um, look at those things I think 
through all of our projects. Um, that would really be something because I think um, and that's that's something that is very hard to program probably. And as you say, you need you need someone there as a helper. Jody, I know you wanted to come in. Um, yeah, I was just going to say the when when doing live music therapy sessions, it's so important to be able to adjust to what um, the participants giving you essentially. And I think that that's what is such a human response that I'm not sure. I'm not sure if just measuring their heartbeat is going to give you that same effect, right? Or like, I know that I need to play, or I feel like we need to play this sort of in the moment. I do, like sometimes there's a really logical reason why you were gonna play a certain song or change the tempo, but also sometimes it's just like something about the way they're looking at you or something that, you know, this isn't working and you change in the moment. And I don't know, I don't know that much about like AI and things like that, but um, I'd like to think that that human response is something that's really important as well, I suppose. I don't think it'll ever be replaced, human interaction, yeah. I mean, no matter how advanced robotics become. Um, you know, it, it, could, it could be uh, the, late, the last um, Ian McEwan uh, novel, um, I think it's called Robots Like Me, which is uh, the story of, uh, of an extremely advanced robot. That didn't admit, but um, yes, the heart rate variability and skin activity is, isn't going to do everything. No, so um, we're going to move to the last, we could talk for hours, as you can see, but um, we, we want to make sure we address all the questions or the themes that are coming up in the questions. Some of them we have already. Um, so I'm just going to invite you back, Nina, because you've been theming these and um, you're going to take over now um, and run the question and answer part of this. So we hope. Um, that we can respond to all the different questions. We've got 15 minutes left to do that. So here goes. Okay. So we've yeah. got uh, lots of great questions from everyone. Um, thanks for sending those in and for uploading them. So the first is uh, quite a general question from Claudia, which everyone might be able to comment on, which asks about the stages of dementia and does the role of the music in the lives of people suffering from dementia depend on which stage of dementia they're in. Mm. So Ming, would you like to, well, anyone actually, but Ming, would you like to kick off? That's a good question. Yeah, so um, we know um, from the, the recent Lancet um, Commission on dementia, prevention, intervention and care, and also in the UK, uh, the Alzheimer's Society, they also have produced a, a paper about the future direction of dementia. Everything is basically um, focused on um, individualizing care. So understanding a person's needs is really kind of the priority. So that means um, what does this person like, uh, which we have discussed already, and also uh, this person's level of cognitive abilities and emotional needs, everything should be factored and to be able to help us select the right kind of music, but also the intervention itself. And what, what sort of target we need to look at is it going to, are we going to use the music to support the management of the symptoms or are we going to use the music to support um, the activities of daily living or different aspects, like I mentioned, maybe sleep is another area that we need to yes. look at. So it really down to um, the individual and we just need to look at everyone's needs, yeah. Yes, so that, so that really in answer, it's not so much the stages, but the actual needs of people. And um, in the film that Claire mentioned for Together in Sound, in fact, some participants talk about um, how difficult um, the evening time going to sleep um, is for helping um, someone go to bed who might be confused and using music as a relaxation time built in and, and in a way it's much more to do with the types of needs than the stages I think I would suggest but there. Um, anyone else want to come in on this one? Um, we've probably we've got a lot more questions so I think um, Nina maybe to some other themes all right, um, so we had a question during Claire's talk on Together in Sound from Ella Millard. Um, she's asked, how do you see the future of these groups being impacted by COVID restrictions and how can the research be adapted? 
Um, okay, so thank you, Emma. Um, I've perhaps answered that a little bit by just letting you know that um, the groups are continuing online. Um, interestingly, our film, um, the film project was interrupted by the lockdown. So we, we had um, planned for the filming to take place from um, February through to April this year. Um, and obviously that was interrupted. And um, we still found ways to complete the film. Um, and it was, it was a bit disappointing to not be able to um, sort of invite participants to a live viewing of the film where we could look at a draft together and comment on it. But what we did was we shared the draft with them um, and then we had a, a focus group. And we, we, we did a number of things actually that were sort of, I guess, adapting to this different environment. We had the live focus group where we could have discussion um, we also used um, some quite sort of targeted kind of polls and questions in the focus group. And then we also invited written feedback from um, participants um, and phoned and spoke to some of the people who had featured in the film. So, you know, we really tried to make sure that we were getting as many different views um, and, and, and feedback as possible. So, yeah, I think... I think we're, we're trying everything we can um, at the moment. Thank you. Um, Jodie, do you want to comment on home side? Because you're, or? Yeah, so you know. we moved online and home side quite early. I suppose we had recruited a few participants that received face-to-face -face intervention and then lockdown happened. And um, so we've moved all of them online now. Um, so that has been like a bit of a learning curve to find out how we can do this online. And it's been working quite well. I mean, sometimes you have technology difficulties and things like that, um, but most of the time you can laugh those off and just switch platforms and try to figure it out together. Um, so yeah, it's carried on and... Um, it's one thing is that um, it's become more accessible. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, because I'm part of it as well, that we've actually been able to reach people in anywhere in England. And that would have been very difficult for that particular project um, in terms of travel for our team. And in fact, we can um, take people from all over England, which has been really exciting. And, and, and I feel that's a good part of the accessibility. We've got screens in the way and we're not face to face, but um, there are many things that become more accessible. And what this event is one of those as well. Um, but thank you. I think we'll move. Yes, Claire, and then we'll... I, I just wanted to just add to that point, Helen, that actually that was also an unexpected benefit for Together in Sound, um, that often over the groups um, and as people, um, people's health changed, um, we would see, find that people were not able to keep coming to the groups in the community. Um, and actually online there has been, we, we had one participant um, who, who was bed bound um, and we were able to join that participant where, where he was um, for the session, which was, was very, very meaningful. Um, and, you know, it, it raises questions for us in terms of how we might adapt um, going forward as, as things change. I'm just going to throw in a comment, which is, I know we're talking about research here, where, where we have an approved protocol and we have to stick to that unless we amend the ethics. But for other people who are doing online sessions, and some have been doing it all the way through, I've been doing some as well, it doesn't have to be the same as it was when it's in person. It's, it's the important thing is making a connection and and just, you know, being there with that person. So, you know, it, it it's... It's, it's not the end just because we, we can't do what we were doing before. Sure, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, I'm just going to ask whether, Nina, whether there are any questions about um, research design. I'm interested in this because one of the things we, we, we were debating was that um, in some of our projects we're using outcome measures and in others we're collecting data um, from interviews um, in, in semi-structured ways so that people just talk freely and we gather um, feedback in a different way and Claire talked about her narrative inquiry and at the other extreme we're running a randomized controlled trial and so that might just be my interest thinking about um, the fact that 
I think it's best to run research where you've got both aspects, so a mixed methods. Um, but other people might have other views, and I wondered if there are any questions from the audience on that. There is one question about uh, future, the design of a future study to do with radio yeah. me. So Emily oh. Pembridge has asked, should radio me be successful? It'd be interesting to conduct a study to compare the outcomes of that and music therapy itself. Is there a plan for this? Um, well, well, installing a music therapist in the person's home in, in the cupboard, I think is, no. uh, there isn't, and I, I, I mean, obviously that's an important part, as I hopefully described clearly, that we, you know, a music therapist will go into each participant's home and play the music live just to see what happens when we, we man manipulate those pieces of music that they've identified as their, as their top 20 for relaxing, calming music. Um, but then comparing it, I mean, I think the next stage after, uh, for Radio Me would be, would be, if we're successful in coming up with a system, would be actually then doing a, a, you know, a, a trial. I suppose doing a three-armed one with a the music therapist going in, um, ooh, I don't know, yeah, it's a good, good question actually, I don't know, would it be daily, because would they be using the Radio Me system every day, so music therapist, yeah, good for thought. thought. There are some yeah. thoughts about that across um other countries and teams i think thinking about those sorts of questions um jody did you want to say something or have we as the moment passed the moment has passed okay okay thank you so nina we'll come back to you how are we doing with the questions great so we also have a question about um these interventions that we've been referring to in terms of the research design and finn has asked um pondering what the intervention is in each of these projects is it perhaps the active and embodied relationship afforded by music as much as the physiological impact of the music? That's very nicely put, I think. Um, I don't know if people want to respond. Um, probably captures some of the things we've been trying to put together. But um, anyone, Ming, were you wanting to? I'm just trying to read you all through the screen here. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I think I think I would I would agree um, with what Finn has has written there, um, and I you know when I think about an active and embodied relationship um, afforded by music, I think about all of the things that that might involve. Um, so, for a participant who perhaps doesn't have language the interaction in music can allow a relationship both with themselves to the music and to the other people around them um and yeah so i i, I think it's very nicely put yeah. and um and and uh, yeah i agree and have seen that in in the work i do in together in sound thank you um so the final question or theme i think we can move to now nina and I apologise to everybody whose questions haven't been addressed and there might be ways you can contact us and, you know, continue on a discussion. We're very much, very keen um, to engage with, with people on, on topics. And so I'll just say, in, in, you know, I um, apologise if we haven't answered your individual question. Um, but Nina, is there a final theme or question we can put to everyone? Yeah, we had a question from Emily Pembridge about the Radio Me study as well, some clarification of some of the things that Alex was talking about. Um, so if the study is successful, will it always be the same pieces of music used or how will they vary? And will mm -hmm. it be a live-in care with the participant while they're testing this to ensure it's helpful to the participant at all times? So at this stage, um it's it's just one playlist of 20 uh, per cohort so you could see in the design we had cohorts of 20 and then another 20 and then another 20 um, but that then I think we'd, we'd have to look beyond that I mean some people might come up with with more than 20 songs very easily so we just don't know at the moment but that's a good point and what was the second part Nina again will there be a live-in care with the participant while they're testing Yes, and that is helpful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, um, 
we want to work with with the, the person and uh, the carer that's living there as well and design the uh, the system for identifying the music whether it's a questionnaire um, or, or another way of, of doing it yeah although actually one idea behind radio me is that we were hoping that it would be helpful for people who don't have somebody living in all the time so um we've thought a lot about how well it could be that someone would need to be coming in and out to do what alex just suggested but at other times the people may be in um stages where they're still able to be independent yeah so i i think i was just listening thinking hopefully we're we are actually between the studies and between all the work we're doing working with people um yeah. in different stages and different um parts of of living um with with dementia um, and we also have had feedback about the positive aspects of both research and um how being in music therapy can sometimes um make people forget about the idea of living with dementia that the experience seems to make it less obvious when they're actually in making music that is something that's come from the together in sound project and i think from some of the feedback from um, we're getting so far from home side as well um, so it's it's difficult to end knowing that we won't have um, addressed everybody's questions but um i'd like to hand back to Nina in a minute, just first of all, I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to thank all, all of you attending and it's very frustrating not being able to see you and um, greet you in ways that we used to be able to do. Um, but we can see that you've come from all over the world and from all different um, walks of life and experiences. And thank you for sharing your experiences in the chat and questions. And then also thank you to all the panelists, thank you to the team, to my colleagues, um, to all of you for um, working really hard on this this week. Um, and Lena, can I have back to you because I know you mentioned at the beginning some instructions about filling in the survey. We really would like your feedback. Um, yes. Um, so when the webinar finishes, you'll the survey will pop up on your screen um, and we'd be really grateful if you could fill this out um, as this will give us some ideas for future events and we can hear about what you want to hear from in the future. Um, and we are recording this so it will be available on the Simter YouTube channel um, if you want to see it in the future. And we've also had some requests for slides so if you could get in touch with us at uh, simter at aru.ac.uk we can send those to you there uh, as well. So also the ones that weren't as clear, so you can have a closer look. Um, and our next webinar is taking place on the 5th of October with Dr. Kate Jones, who will be discussing music therapy for children with selective mutism. Um, and the link for that will be in an email after the webinar as well. So we'd love for you to join us for that webinar uh, in two weeks time. So thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you very much. Nina, Claire wants to have a final word. I just want to um, give a little plug just to say that um, we are um, welcoming new participants for Together in Sound. Um, it is participants who are in the Saffron Walden, sort of South Cambridgeshire area. So if anybody knows anybody who potentially might be interested, please um, get in touch either with us at Simtra or with um, Saffron Hall. Great. Thank you. And Jody, finally. I'll reiterate that for Homeside as well. And we're recruiting UK wide. So if you know anyone who would like to get involved, get in touch. <laughs> okay, well, I think, I guess um, it's, it's goodbye from me and goodbye <laughs> to all of you. Um, and thank you very much again, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, Helen. Bye. Bye. Thank you.